Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program is about to begin.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program is about to begin.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your mistress of ceremonies, Kathy Ireland. everyone welcome we are so excited to be here on this historic evening to celebrate our pro-life victories tonight it is my esteemed privilege to kick off the evening by welcoming to the stage a strong vocal defender of life from our friends in the entertainment world please join me in welcoming award-winning recording artist Joy Vila, who will perform the national anthem. For all who are able, please stand. That was extraordinary. It is such a joy to see all of you here tonight. Thank you. I would now like to welcome to the stage His Excellency Archbishop Christophe Pierre to lead us in tonight's invocation. He was the Apostolic Nuncio to Mexico until he was appointed Apostolic Nuncio of the United States by, of America by His Holiness Pope Francis on April 12th 2016, please welcome His Excellency Archbishop Christophe Pierre to the stage. Good evening. Let us pray. Lord God, author of life, you feed the birds of the skies and array the lilies of the field. You know the number of hairs upon our head. Even in the womb, you knew us and loved us. It is you who has made us so wonderfully and has fashioned us in your image and likeness. We join with all creation in praising your holy name. Grateful for the company that we share this evening and the food that we are about to receive, 
we invoke the blessing of your spirit upon this gift, our conversation, and upon the many benefactors and supporters of the Susan B. Anthony list and upon all gathered here. Humbly we pray that renewed and strengthened by your countless blessings and generosity toward us, we might be more fit for your service in the defense and promotion of human life and in building a culture of life and a civilization of love in which every person and every life, no matter how small or weak, is cherished, valued, and loved. We ask this and all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Everyone, because we are graced by the President and each one of you are such important guests, may we all be comfortable and please begin enjoying our wonderful salads. Now, before we continue tonight's program, Marjorie has asked that you learn about a very important, meaningful collection of memorabilia from the White House Historical Association. Each of you have been automatically added into our door prize as part of your gala registration, and the winner will receive special items which are curated for you tonight by the White House Historical Association. We will draw the winner later this evening. As we celebrate the growing strength in our advocacy for life, we have peace and certainty that we must do all that is moral, all that is legal to save these unborn children. We know that is true and we know what is right. And incredibly, for many years, my heart was pro-life, my votes and thoughts were not. Who was I to tell a woman what to do during what is often called a crisis pregnancy? As a teenager, Planned Parenthood visited our high school campus and instilled a mindset that took more than a decade for me to demolish. It, it wasn't my faith, because sadly, I avoided reading the Bible for so long. It was scientific facts. You all know that science tells us from the moment of conception, a new life comes into being. The complete genetic blueprint is there. The blood type determined, the sex, the unique set of fingerprints all determined. But what kind of life is it? According to the law of biogenesis, all life comes from pre-existing life and each species reproduces after its own kind. Therefore, human beings can only reproduce human beings. We don't begin as one species and suddenly become human along the way. And I didn't want to be pro-life. It terrified me, so I picked up the phone and I called Planned Parenthood and I said, help me out, give me your best argument for being pro-choice. I was told if you get it early enough, it's just a bunch of cells, and if you get it early enough, it doesn't even look like a baby. I was like, that's it? That's all you've got? We're all a bunch of cells, and the unborn doesn't look like a baby the same way a child doesn't look like a senior citizen, but that unborn human being looks exactly the way human beings are supposed to look at that stage of life. There are some who say that it's a woman's body, it's her choice. I am someone who always has and always will fight for women's rights, and that's what I love about Susan B. Anthony Association, is that this organization fights for the baby and the mother. Yes. 
When a woman is pregnant, there's a 50% chance the baby she's carrying is a male child. That baby would have a penis. The mother clearly does not. The baby is not a part of her body. The baby resides within her body. This is a human rights crisis. Since becoming pro-life, I've spoken with our nation's leading scientists, pleading with them to please show me some shred of evidence that the unborn is not a human being. That request with, was met with silence, and then, well, it's very complicated, Kathy. And my response was, the situation surrounding a crisis pregnancy is complicated, and everybody who identifies as pro-life must support the mother in all these areas. But the issue itself, is not complicated at all. If the unborn is not a human being, have as many abortions as you want, whenever you want, no justification is necessary. If, however, the unborn is a human being, no justification is adequate unless we are acting to save another life, the life of the mother. In that instance, we're not acting to kill, we're acting to save a life. And the tragic consequence is that the baby dies but our intent is to save. With abortion, the sole intent is to kill. Whenever people infer that our family supports, in fact, battles for the unborn because our savior is Jesus Christ, we acknowledge that truth. But you need not share our faith or any at all to realize that abortion is a politically correct marketing term for the pre-planned death of a baby. Most people in our country realize that this is terribly wrong. And while we must never judge a mother who makes such a tragic decision, we must never lie to ourselves by believing that the baby whose life is stolen is the sole victim, the mom who we now know is frequently diagnosed as a survivor of PTSD, the dad who has no paternal rights, our society which loses the contributions that this child could potentially make, the organization which fights us relentlessly says every child should be wanted. Our response, which is so often unheard and not reported, is that every child is wanted. <laughs> However, it is not necessarily by the mom who brings that child into the world. When life is destroyed in the womb, the millions of us who love, want, and would save that life have our hearts broken as well. We never have the opportunity to rescue, welcome, and love the escalating millions of babies whose deaths are called and marketed as abortions. Gratefully, there are years where the reported numbers decline. That does nothing to restore the millions of children who have already been taken from all of us. Our son and daughter-in-law, Eric and Bethany Ireland Olson volunteered to produce a video on a shining rainbow of people who have joined our fight for the unborn. They asked people from all over America and throughout the world, including Pakistan and Israel, to speak with you tonight about their passion for life. Please turn your attentions to the screens so that you may experience the powerful truth and support the diversity that we have and the work for the Susan B. Anthony List. Hi, I'm Kathy Ireland. Before recognizing the inerrant, unchanging Word of God clearly confirms the humanity and value of the unborn, I became pro-life through science. Abortion isn't a woman's rights issue. It is a human rights crisis. My mother was going to abort me because it's not she didn't want to keep me, it's just because she was so poor. But then she gave me a second chance. She told me the story. I said, 
I'm going to decide to keep this baby. God is going to take care of me. I was not going to be born, but now I am born. I am alive. Either one believes that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Or one doesn't believe it. I do believe it. Actually, the pro-life principle is simply a combination of a scientific fact and a principle of justice. The scientific fact is that each and every human being is a human being from the earliest embryonic stage forward. Well, you know, when I was first elected to Congress in 2004, I said uh, I will always, always be pro-life, uh, no, no matter what. Uh, I never expected that uh, I would, in essence, uh, I'll be one of the last pro-life Democrats uh, still serving in, in the U.S. House. About a third of uh, Democratic voters are, are pro-life. And so uh, we need to make sure that, uh, that they ha have a voice and it'll, it'll help us to uh, move pro-life legislation forward. Shalom from Jerusalem. This is Amir Tsarfati, And I would like to congratulate America for a great president. President Trump said to the participants of the March for Life on January 19 this year that life is the greatest miracle of all that every child is a precious gift from God, and that every life is sacred. And I would like to reiterate those words with a verse from the Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, God said, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. I choose to choose life. Because I've been blessed with some pretty amazing women in my life, the thought of me as a man ever telling a woman what she should and should not do with her body has truly never crossed my mind. I don't have that right, nor do I have the right to sit in judgment of anyone, ever. But when it comes to the safety and the well-being being of an unborn child, then we all need to step up and say something. Every life matters, especially the ones who have no voice. We believe, we we believe in the sanctity, in the sanctity of, life. of life. Hi, I'm Brianna, and this is Dahlia Childers, and we support the sanctity of life. Hey, my name is Dominic Bally, and I support the right to life. My name is Minaya, and I'm a Pakistani Muslim. What's living is just as human as any of us, and I support the right to that, the right to life. I'm Brian. I support the right to life. My name is Saba. I'm from Ethiopia, Tigray region. I support the right to life. Thank you, and thank you, Eric and Bethany. As this video was being put together, it was so encouraging to recognize that the life movement is embraced by people of every faith, by people of no faith at all, by people of every socioeconomic background, every political belief, every race and color, gay activists for life, atheist activists for life, Let's shatter labels and come together and fight for the unborn. It is now my honor to introduce the president of Susan B. Anthony List, Marjorie Dannon Felser. Yes. Marjorie. Marjorie's strategy, her expertise, and her firm conviction that fighting for life 
is not only morally right, but politically smart, have propelled this great organization to the national pro-life powerhouse that it is today. Under Marjorie's leadership, SBA List has grown its ranks to more than 600,000 grassroots members across the country. As head of SBA List, Marjorie presided over the most ambitious pro-life get out the vote effort in history in 2016, reaching more than 1 million voters at their homes and is leading SBA List to double that record ahead of this year's elections. Marjorie served as chairwoman of President Trump's pro-life coalition and is a regular at the White House these days, which speaks to how far the pro-life movement has come and the incredible opportunities in front of us for everything Marjorie has done to advance the cause of life and promote strong women in office. We thank her. Ladies and gentlemen, Please help me in welcoming my hero, Marjorie Dannon Felser. She grew up on the side of the road where the church bells ring and strong love grows. She grew up good, she grew up slow, like American. Boy, Kathy Towers in every single way. <laughs> this mic. Um, before I do you know what, introduce a certain guy, I'd like to show you in a short video um, what you have helped produce at the Susan B. Anthony List, which is a perfect um, continuation of the beauty that you saw in the video that Kathy produced. So cue the video. We know that life is the greatest miracle of all. Under my administration, we will always defend the very first right, the right to life. We've been working very carefully on the four commitments that the Trump-Pence ticket made to the pro-life movement. To defund Planned Parenthood, to nominate only pro-life Supreme Court justices and federal judges, to protect taxpayer funds from abortion through the Hyde Amendment, and to pass the pain-capable bill, that 20-week ban on abortion. We do have a pro-life presidency. We've got a pro-life House. We have almost a pro-life majority in the Senate. Almost isn't enough, though. The Senate matters because the Supreme Court matters. We have an opportunity, the best in 45 years since Roe versus Wade. The only way to determine the makeup of the Senate is that voters in Senate battleground states get to work. Voter mobilization this November is everything. Elections matter. Elections have tremendous consequences. We've seen that in this last election. So that is why Susan B. Anthony is so effective. Uh, they get things done. We so appreciate Susan B. Anthony list because they are grassroots. We've got a real job on our hands. We do not want to slip back, especially when we have a president who is willing to work with us on pro-life issues. The Susan B. Anthony list has the largest ground game in the nation when it comes to turning out voters to the polls on Election Day. We began our field operation last summer with canvassers visiting homes in the battleground states of Ohio, Florida, Indiana, and Missouri. We have more than 500 canvassers on the ground in those states. They've already visited more than one million homes. We are poised to expand into four additional states. Montana, North Dakota, West Virginia, and Wisconsin, where additional vulnerable pro-abortion senators must be defeated. If funding permits, our team will grow to more than 1,000 canvassers before Election Day, and we will visit a record 2 million homes to locate and motivate inconsistent pro-life voters who might otherwise stay home. The Susan B. Anthony model really works. They will knock on doors, they will send out mail outs, they're a persuasive group. In my last Senate race, Susan B. Anthony volunteers knock on almost 50,000 doors. Those feet on the street made a big difference and it was great to see. We won by about 48,000 votes. And if you take a look at the number of doors that Susan B. Anthony list knocked on, it was the difference maker. 
Most Americans are with us on the issues. They overwhelmingly oppose late-term abortion, taxpayer-funded abortion, and a radical pro-abortion agenda. However, they may not realize how critical this election is to the future of unborn children or how extreme their senator's record is. By delivering this message personally at their homes, we increase voter turnout on average by 6.6%. We are on the verge of revolution when it comes to Roe versus Wade, and that is because there is a strong possibility that we'll have at least one opening on the Supreme Court. The most important thing that can happen this election is that voters elect senators who will confirm a Supreme Court justice who will be the final vote to overturn Roe versus Wade. And what will happen at that point? It will mean that finally our nation is free to pass laws that will save the lives of unborn little girls and boys who are intended for this world. It's worth every bit of fundraising, every blood, sweat, and tear, every moment on our knees, lobbying in the Capitol and in the U.S. Senate. It's worth it all for one particular reason. The life of one unborn boy, one unborn girl, is so valuable and it's worth every single minute of it. <laughs> Thank you. So let us clear our throat. We need about 60 seconds and I'll be right back.
the president is also taller than I am. He's going to have to adjust his own mic. <laughs> okay, we got everything situated. So glad to be here. Isn't this beautiful? I mean, really, look at this. We have a lot to be grateful for, don't we? Well, the president's staff messed up my paper. <laughs> Hold on for one moment, please. <laughs> So thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, to the Susan B. Anthony List Board of Directors for your leadership. Please stand up. For our Executive Vice President, Emily Buchanan, for your genius man management. For Frank Cannon, for your strategic guidance, please stand up. With the help of God's grace, the talent of the SBA List team, and so many of you in this room, you have nurtured and built Susan B. Anthony List step by step for such a moment as this. Ladies and gentlemen, guess who's coming for dinner tonight? The President of the United States of America. <laughs> It's possible you knew this. His presence here marks an historic moment in the tough and tender project we share. The mission of protecting boys and girls waiting to be born and embracing their mothers in need of our love. Picture with me for a moment, though, what we might have had and where we actually are. If the 2016 election so closely fought had turned out differently, if your Susan B. Anthony List battleground plan had not succeeded, we would not be paving the way for states to disentangle Planned Parenthood from taxpayer funding. We'd be fighting to save the Hyde Amendment. We would be witnessing the export of abortion internationally by our government with our own tax dollars over the brave objections of heroes from Nigeria, like our pro-life activist Obiwanju Okiacha, well said, right? We would be watching federal regulators use Obamacare to expand government paid abortions by fiat and forcing more people, including nuns, to pay for abortions. We would be grieving the loss of support for women and children as pregnancy centers get forced to close down their businesses, not looking for ways in the federal government to support their beautiful work. We would not be talking about enacting pro-life laws in defiance of Roe versus Wade. We'd be strategizing around the margins to see if there was any pro-life law we could save and watching helplessly while the government installed pro-abortion judges top to bottom on the federal bench. But we fought in 216 for a different future. We fought for them, the mothers and the children, and they are worth fighting for. <clears throat> we fought and we won together. We won an historic opportunity. Thanks to your support, if we elect a pro-life Senate this year, we have a fighting chance to do what the pro-life movement has wanted to do since 1973, to overturn the great stain on our national conscience, Roe versus Wade. <laughs> Had we stood down and allowed the forces against life to appoint new Supreme Court justices, today's opportunity would have been shut down, closed off, lost for a generation at least, at least a generation, if not forever. But now, why do we have this chance? Because of all your hard work, your contributions, your time, your talent, your love, and because of the grace of God to whom we give thanks. But it's also because of one man. One man who stood up for the unborn, unborn boys and girls who invited us in and who kept his word. Many doubted, and that is understandable. We've been betrayed before. He had no record to run on. But I am here to tell you today that when it comes to life, 
President Trump is keeping his promises. A man of his word, he has talked the talk and he has walked the walk, starting well before his swearing in. He is fighting the good fight. Yes, he's been hard at work talking tight, sorry, stopping our tax dollars from funding abortion at home and abroad, but he's done more. He's been reforming the courts at a record pace with judges who respect life the Constitution, and the will of the American people. But he's done more. Yes, personnel is policy, and some of the key people here tonight are testimony to President Trump's commitment to life. Kellyanne Conway, Mark Short, Paul Teller, Nick Ayers, Justin Clark, Sarah Sanders, Johnny DiStefano, and there are so many, including all the cabinet secretaries, it's impossible, and that speaks loudly, to mention all of them. President Trump has done everything in his power to protect unborn children and their mothers and get American taxpayers out of the abortion business for good. He is the most pro-life president in history, and he will do more if we fight for his pro-life agenda at the polls in November. We must have a Senate that's not just Republican, but pro-life. <laughs> and with your help at the Susan B. Anthony list, we have assembled the largest ground game in the nation for this purpose. This November, I promise you, and I promise the pro-abortion forces, we will be visiting millions of homes, letting voters know what their elected officials are doing here in Washington, having life-giving conversations, not just with partisans, but with citizens of every race, every creed and color, who know that late-term abortion is an abomination that must end, and that they and their children are worth fighting for. This is an historic moment, and dear friends and people of good conscience, we are at the cusp of changing history and restoring our right to fight for the laws that protect children and women in every state in this country. We are one Supreme Court judge away, and we need not only a president we trust to appoint, but a Senate that will confirm his judges. The moment is here, and the man is too. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the incredible honor and privilege to introduce to you tonight a man who has led as he campaigns, who has been as good as his word in fighting for life, a man who is worth fighting for because they are worth fighting for. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. And I'm proud to be an American. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you, Marjorie, for that wonderful introduction. All my friends are out here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So nice. And I'm thrilled to be here tonight at the very first, and as the very first president, to address this incredible group of people. I have a lot of friends in the audience. They are incredible people. And I'd also like to thank the Susan B. Anthony List Chairwoman Jane Abraham and her husband, the Honorable Spence Abraham, for hosting this beautiful gala. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Beautiful job. And we're also very glad to be joined by many wonderful members of Congress, including the legend from Louisiana, very brave guy, Steve Skillies. Where's Steve? Where's Steve? Hi, Steve. So I was going to ask all members of Congress to stand, but there's a short list. Should I just — we have to do this, right? They're fighting for you all the time, right? Don't you think? All right. You have Steve. Steve, stand. You have no problem standing. This guy's in better shape than all of us. <laughs> Kevin Brady. Where's Kevin? What a man he is. How are you? Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Steve Danes. Steve Danes. Hi, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Great. Where's Roger Wicker? Roger. Roger. Right. You know, the problem with this, Roger, we're guaranteed to leave a few out, and they'll never speak to me again, but that's okay. We'll have you stand if I did that. A man who has been so incredible on television to me, Andy Bix, Congressman. Andy Bix. Where's Andy? Thank you, Andy. Now I don't have to call you and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Andy. Marsha Blackburn. Marsha, good luck. Will hopefully be our next senator from the great, great, great state of Tennessee. Good. And I just saw some great numbers on you, by the way. Where's Steve? Shabrat, where's Steve? Steve. Steve, Steve. How are you, Steve? Been help. Kevin Kramer, who's leading. He's leading in his Senate race. Kevin, where is Kevin? Kevin, you're leading. You know, we have a lot of people that are leading these races, and a number just came down from Reuters. You know, we were, a few months ago, 16 down in the generic poll whatever that's supposed to mean, because nobody really knows what it means. But all I know is we were 16 down. Reuters just came out two hours ago, and we're one up. That's a big difference. And they say that to win, we have to be like, if we're six down, we're in okay shape. Well, we're one up. That's pretty good. So that's for the senators and for the congressmen and women. So that's it. But you're doing fantastic, Kev. Sean. Duffy. Where's Sean? Where's Sean? Thank you, Sean. Great job. Ron Estes. Ron. Thank you, Ron. Jeff Fortenberry. Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Good job. A friend of mine for a long time, Virginia Fox. Virginia. Thanks, Virginia. Representative and Mrs. Greg. Okay, where's Susan? Susan Gianforte. Where is he? Boy, he is a good he is a good campaigner. Great job. Great job. Thank you, Susan. Representative and Mrs. Andy. You know, they wrote this out. They said, and Mrs. Andy and Nicole. So we're just gonna say it. Andy and Nicole Harris, stand up, please. Thank you. Great. Thank you. A man who is — I hope he's here, because he's so busy — but a man who is a true champion, NCAA champion for numerous years. Like, I'm not sure he ever lost a match. Somebody said he's like 141-1, and but that's not bad. Jim Jordan. Where is he? 
Jim Jordan. Where's Jim? He is. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. Great champion. Mike Kelly, I watched him the other day. He was debating Maxine Waters. That was not a close debate. That was not a close debate, Mike. They should all be so easy, right, Mike? Congressman Steve King. Do you think Steve is conservative enough? Where is Steve? Hi, Steve. Is Steve conservative enough, folks? I don't know. You don't get more conservative than Steve, right? Thank you, Steve. Congressman Joe Lesko and Debbie, Mrs. Lesko. Where are you? Thank you, folks. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Dan Lipinski. Thanks, Dan. Keith Rothfuss. Good person. Thank you, Keith. Great job. Great job you're doing. Oh, this man's central casting. I watch him all the time. Don't know him well, but I'll get to know him. John Rutherford. Where is he, John? Central casting. Great job, John. He's always defending me. Actually, most of you are always defending me, and that's okay. And from my neck of the woods, Claudia Tenney. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. And for those many that I've left out, I'm sorry, but I said, give me a totally complete list, and I will call you tomorrow, and I will apologize personally, all right? But every day between now and November, we must work together to elect more lawmakers who share our values, cherish our heritage, and proudly stand for life. And that is a great group of people I introduced, I can tell you that. We're also glad to be joined by a beloved member of my administration, a true fighter for faith and family, and your 2018 distinguished leader, Kellyanne Conway. Kellyanne. What a job. What a job she's done. She is some fighter. She'll do the shows that nobody else dares go near. She'll just, I'll say, do this one or that one. No problem, sir. Others say, sir, do you think I could take a pass, please? I beg you, please. Great going, Kellyanne. Thank you. What a help. What a help. <laughs> Finally, to all of the friends, activists, and supporters of the Life Movement who are here this evening, so many. This was a record crowd. Your hard work helped us to achieve this historic victory, our historic victory, one of the great victories of all time in politics, that beautiful, beautiful evening, November. Remember that evening? Could it have been more beautiful? 2016, ah, that November 8th, 2016. On the other side, you had some very unhappy campers. I get to watch them. They were not happy. They were going to have a big, beautiful party. Didn't turn out to be such a good party. Now, for the first time since Roe v. Wade, America has a pro-life president, a pro-life vice president, a pro-life House of Representatives, and 25 pro-life Republican state capitals. That is pretty good. That is pretty good. Wow. That is pretty good. When I ran for office, I pledged to stand for life. And as president, that's exactly what I've done. And I have kept my promise, and I think everybody here understands that fully. One of my very first acts as president was to reinstate 
the Mexico City policy to prevent taxpayer dollars from funding abortion centers overseas. It's a little reminiscent of Ronald Reagan. A few months later, with Marjorie in the Oval Office, she was sitting there with us, and she stood then and signed legislation to overturn the rule that forced states to fund abortion providers with taxpayer dollars. Marjorie was there with me. We've appointed a record number of judges who will defend our Constitution and interpret the law as written. And we're putting onto the bench a record number of judges. And in a short period of time, we were going to have and are going to have probably the all-time record for the appointment of judges. And I'm very excited about that. My administration has also taken bold action to protect religious liberty. And today, we are making another historic announcement. For decades, American taxpayers have been wrongfully forced to subsidize the abortion industry through Title X federal funding. So today, we have kept another promise. My administration has proposed a new rule to prohibit Title X funding from going to any clinic that performs abortions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're also seeking passage of the 20-week abortion bill, which would end painful late-term abortions nationwide. The House just passed the bill, but Democrats in the Senate are doing everything within their power to block it, although some are actually on our side. But they are working overtime to block it. So the story is, 18 midterms, we need Republicans, and that will happen. <laughs> on this issue, like so many other issues, the Democratic Party is far outside the American mainstream. Far outside. The United States is one of only seven countries in the world to allow elective abortions after 20 weeks, when unborn babies can truly feel the pain. Yet, Democratic senators like John Tester, Heidi Heitkamp, Claire McCaskill, Debbie Stabenow, all voted against the 20-week bill and in favor of late-term abortion. <laughs> Got to get out and vote. We are nine votes away from passing the 20-week abortion bill in the Senate, so we have to get them out there. The Democratic senators are up for re-election in 10 states that I won by a lot. And I think we're doing very well. We have some of those folks that are running right now, and they're doing very, very well. I have a big, big surprise in six months. Big, beautiful surprise. If we work hard between now and November, every one of these states can be flipped to a senator who shares our values and votes our agenda. Democrats like to campaign as moderates at election time. But when they go to Washington, they always vote 
for the radical Pelosi agenda down the line. Can you imagine having Nancy Pelosi as the Speaker of the House? Can you imagine? No, can you imagine? That's why we're putting in place a massive campaign for a midterm victory this November. We will need to elect more members of Congress who will protect life, support our military, secure our borders, and grow our economy, and continue making America great again. While Democrats in Washington are resisting progress, my administration is delivering progress for hardworking Americans each and every day, and we're doing some job. Since the election, we have created more than 3.3 million new jobs. And if I would have said that prior to the election, those people back there, you know who that is, right? That's called the fake news, fake news. They would have said, what a ridiculous statement. He's saying he's going to project 3.3 million new jobs. How ridiculous is that? Well, guess what? We did it. Fake news. Something I'm very proud of. African-American unemployment is at the lowest level in history. Hispanic unemployment is likewise at the lowest level in history. <laughs> Women, unemployment is at the lowest level in 19 years. And something you haven't heard for 21 years, wages are rising at the fastest pace in more than Time. They said 21. I did hear 19. I have to be very accurate with these folks. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Wages are rising at a very fast level. <laughs> very fast. <laughs> Got to be very careful. You know, when you say something, if it's like a little off. If I was off by a week and a half, it's a headline tomorrow. <laughs> we got them now. Something very important, small business optimism, is the highest that it's ever been, ever recorded. And our great House Ways and Means Chairman, Kevin Brady, joins us tonight, has done an incredible job. Thank you, Kevin. With his leadership, Republicans passed the biggest tax cut and reform in American history. And we doubled the child tax credit. And we're going to be with Kevin and the entire group. We're going to be submitting additional tax cuts sometime prior to November. It's going to be something very special. You see what it's done for the country? It's going to be something very, very special. And by the way, Nancy Pelosi and the group, you heard her the other day. She wants to raise your taxes. They want to get rid of the tax cut bill and raise your taxes. Somehow, I don't think that plays well, but you never know, right? wants to raise your taxes. And my presidential budget was the first in history to include a proposal for nationwide paid family leave. Good, Steve. Good. We want to honor 
the invaluable time parents spend with their newborn children. On foreign affairs, you've been reading a lot about foreign affairs. We're getting very high marks on foreign affairs, actually. We are, as a country, respected again. It's been a long time. Because we've restored American strength and confidence. Our military, and we just had it approved, $700 billion. It's historic funding for our great military. $700 billion. And we have left the horrible, one-sided, miserable Iran deal. It's gone. One of the worst deals ever negotiated. We get nothing. We get nothing. We've moved our embassy to Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you. And we are renegotiating trade deals to bring jobs and wealth back home to America where they and it belongs. Working hard on the trade deals. But if Democrats gain power, they will try to reverse these incredible gains. These are historic gains. They will try and reverse many of them. So your vote in 2018 is every bit as important as your vote in 2016. Although I'm not sure I really believe that, but you know. I don't know who the hell wrote that line. I'm not sure. But it's still important, remember. That. That's why we will be campaigning for every last vote in every part of our great country. We will be campaigning for the votes of all Americans, whether they're registered as Democrats, and we got a lot of Democrats voting for us, as you know, in 16. A lot. They couldn't believe it. They could not believe it. We got a lot of Barack Obama voters voting for us. We got a lot of Bernie Sanders voting for us. Can you believe it? Mostly people that didn't like get, getting ripped off on trade, Bernie Sanders voters. He was right about that, but he wasn't able to do anything about it. These are people that want a government that protects faith, family, and life. To support Republican candidates, I have helped raise a record-breaking $175 million for the Republican National Committee. Nobody has ever been close. And as part of our unprecedented effort, our great Vice President, a true leader in the pro-life movement, Mike has been a true leader has been working to elect more and more Republicans. We will be appealing to voters all across America who previously sent a Democrat to Washington only to discover they elected a proxy vote for Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. These are people that don't believe in borders, don't believe in fighting crime, don't believe in making a strong military. They don't believe in what the people in this room believe. That I can tell you. So we have to do a great job. If Democrats ever gained power, they would try to put up the taxes, so many things, open those borders. They don't want walls. They don't want people stopping. And the other day, just the other day, Nancy Pelosi came out in favor of MS-13. That's the first time I've heard that. 
She wants them to be treated with respect, as do other Democrats. That's not going to be happening. We're not going to release violent criminals into our country. We're going to shut down everything we have to shut down, and we're going to open up the great American energy. We are going to open up our energy. And in all fairness, that's already happened. We are now a net exporter of energy for the first time. And we all know what a Democratic majority would mean, especially for the people in this room on the Supreme Court. These are the stakes on Election Day, and this is why you need to fight for victory in November. We can't be complacent. What happens historically, a tremendous percentage of the time, you win the presidential election, you become complacent. You're happy. Oh, we won. Isn't it wonderful? Then you have another election comes up pretty quickly. Two years, all of these congressmen can tell you. See, the senators, they like, they like their term a little bit better. How about changing some of them to two years, too? I don't think it's going to be. That would be a tough vote in the Senate, wouldn't it? But all of a sudden, you come up again, and they get complacent. They say, oh, we just won. So we sit back. The other side has energy. And they win. It's a tremendous percentage of the time. I honestly don't believe that's going to happen this time. And it's starting to show up in the polls. Really don't believe it. Every values voter must be energized, mobilized, and engaged. You have to get out there. This organization bears the name of one of the greatest champions of freedom. In American history, Susan B. Anthony. She fought for decades to end slavery, to secure women's right to vote, and to respect the dignity of every single person. A great person, a great woman was she. Now we have a chance to honor her legacy and restore the first right in the Declaration of Independence. It's called the right to life. Here with us this evening are Lisa and Bruce Alexander and their family from Gaithersburg, Maryland. Good place. In January of 2012, the Alexanders attended the March for Life, and God put it in their hearts to adopt a beautiful child. Two years later, in January of 2014, the Alexanders got a call that a baby had been born who was opioid dependent. She desperately needed a loving home. She was in serious, serious trouble. And the Alexanders welcomed her into their home with wide open arms. After the baby was treated, for opioid withdrawal, they brought home their new and very beautiful daughter, Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi. Hi, sweetie. Come on up here, Catherine. Come on. Catherine's four years old, and she is full of incredible energy, spirit, and talent. At the age of two, come on up, Catherine. She memorized America the Beautiful. She recites poetry. And recently, she announced to her dad that when she grows up, she wants to be a famous police officer. And then, when she gets tired of that, she wants to become president. That's OK with her.
She'll be president someday. Every time Catherine's older siblings come home from school, Catherine runs into their arms and gives them a great, big, beautiful hug. They're amazed by how much she loves them and how much they love her. So tonight, we celebrate you, Catherine. We celebrate your life. Thank you, darling. And we celebrate all lives. We celebrate the loving choice of adoption. Catherine reminds us that every life is sacred and that every child is a precious gift from God. So true. As the Lord says in Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. When a mother and a father hold a new baby in their arms, they are changed forever. When a child says, Mommy or Daddy, for the first time, there's nothing like it anywhere in the world. No matter what you do, there is nothing like it. And when parents watch their children thrive and grow, they're filled with a joy beyond words and a love beyond measure. You know that, everybody in this room. When we look into the eyes of a newborn child, there is no doubt we see the beauty of the human soul and the mystery of God's great creation. We know that every life has meaning and that every life is totally worth protecting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. When we stand for life, we stand for the true source of America's greatness. It's our people. Our people are great. It's the people who grace our lives, who sustain our communities, and who make America a nation, a home, and this magnificent land that we all love so much. As long as we have faith in our citizens, confidence in our values, and trust in our God, then we will never, ever fail. Our nation will thrive. Our people will prosper. And America will be greater than ever before. And that's what's happening. So this November, vote for family. Vote for love. Vote for faith and values. Vote for country. And vote for life. I want to just end by thanking the Susan B. Anthony List. You are very, very special people. It is a great honor for me to be here tonight. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to life and liberty. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you.
president. We will be back with the rest of the program shortly. Please enjoy your dinner. <laughs>